Here we go, guys. What's up? Welcome back to another Fish the Moment live stream. Sorry for the delay. We were having all kinds of technical difficulties. These are all on my end. Not sure what was happening. The streaming software wasn't connecting, and then the recording wasn't working. But we're all good now, and we're excited to talk about some summer topwater secrets tonight. Randy, how's it going? It's going good here, Johnny. That's Man, you're right in my alley. There's nothing more than I love than seeing those bass blow up on those topwaters in the summertime, man. It's like... You know, the, the thing that I love about summertime bass fishing in, for topwater fishing is you can literally catch them in a foot of water or over 50 foot of water and everything in between. It's the most diverse time of year to catch bass on topwaters. For sure. It's exciting to see them blow up, but it's also a high risk, high reward technique. If you can put five in the boat, you're usually going to do really, really well. But getting those fish in the boat can be really tricky because you only get five to seven bites a day and they don't always commit. So we'll talk about how we target those better than average fish with topwaters in the summertime, the times of day you should be fishing these topwaters, the type of areas. We're going to be breaking it all down for you tonight on the stream. Before we do that, though, let's uh, say hi to some of the guys here in the chat. We've got Ryan, Timo, uh, Byron, PK, Jason, Darren, Chad. How's it going, guys? Mike, ton of guys in here. Good to see everyone on, as always. And one other thing we want to do is announce the winner from last week's Bridgeford giveaway. So you guys know we are sponsored on the live stream of the podcast by Bridgeford Foods. Huge shout out to them. Uh, make some amazing beef jerky and just other great snacks to take out on the boat. And the winner of our giveaway last week, who wins a case of Bridgeford beef jerky, is Christopher French. He made a comment on the live stream about LiveScope. And I thought that he gave a really good suggestion about maybe a future study that I'm going to do about the LiveScope, Randy. He basically said that uh, if, someone were to te- if someone were to test in a scientific way, the hypothesis that sonar, like live scope, will spook bass, you'd have to turn off the sonar and record casts to catch fish over a period of time, maybe three or four days, maybe in the same location, maybe not. Focus on one, maybe water clarity, one depth, maybe try it in different water clarities, and then maybe use the same technique to see how the sonar, like live scope, affects the fish, how close you can get to them. It's a really, really in-depth comment. I'm not going to get into all of it, but appreciate the, the thought on that, Christopher. And if you are watching now or if you're watching afterwards, uh, just send us an email at info at fishthemoment.com with your mailing address and we'll ship you a full case 12 packs of Bridgeford beef jerky. That's a pretty good deal, Randy. That'll hold you over for at least uh, five or six fishing trips or if you're with me and my wife, like half a fishing trip. But otherwise, uh, really excited to uh, be doing these giveaways. Huge shout out to Bridgeford again for sponsoring the podcast, supporting bass fishing, and helping keep you guys well fed on the water. So again, huge shout out to Bridgeford there. Now, if you guys are wanting to get into the giveaway um, for this week, I will talk about it here when we do our uh, mid-stream break, about 30 minutes in. So stay tuned. I'll tell you how you can um, enter into this week's giveaway so you can get your own case of Bridgeford Beef Jerky. I've seen a couple of guys uh, who are uh, saying they're happy. Matt, uh, he won the jerky a couple of weeks ago. It's great. It's awesome. So uh, yeah, definitely stay tuned and we'll get you guys a chance to win more jerky. So uh, basically, if you um, if you are uh, you know interested in this topwater fishing strategy, guys, this summertime topwater fishing, you may have seen YouTube videos about it. You may have heard us talking about it. It's pretty complex, and we want to really get into that in this stream because it's not as straightforward as just picking up a topwater and going fishing. And you know, the title or the uh, thumbnail for this live stream in the video or five secrets for catching topwater bass you go you guys know we gotta we gotta make the thumbnails really spicy and really uh engaging to get the clicks to get the views that's how youtube works but to keep with that theme of five different topics five secrets we what we want to do is break up topwater fishing in five different types of lakes so we're going to be covering deep clear reservoirs shallow dirty reservoirs or maybe kind of like those uh swampy lakes even uh your average man-made impoundment that's going to be you know two to four foot of water visibility maybe some current maybe not we'll be talking about river systems and also grass lakes down south now we only have time to cover kind of these southern impoundments we're not going to be talking too much about the northern lakes unfortunately 
that would be a whole other stream because it's completely different on the top wire front up north. But we're going to try to cover at least those five lake types because that's where most of our listeners are from. And hopefully you guys are going to get some great info on all those different lake types. So anyways, let's uh, jump straight into this, Randy, by start starting to talk about a deep, clear lake. And for that, we're going to start talking about Lake Murray in North Carolina. North Carolina, South Carolina. I know it's like right there. On yeah, the South Carolina. South Carolina. Okay, Lake Murray, South Carolina. And I'm going to start talking a little bit here, Randy, about uh, some of the offshore stuff. But before I get into all that, I want you to kind of go through some of the shallow water fishing with topwaters on a lake like Lake Murray. Well, you know, uh, this whole deal about what we're talking about topwater, guys, it has everything to do, and Johnny, I'll get into this a little bit later, it has everything to do with a combination of factors. And those factors include water clarity, they include the type of rock structure you have on the bank, whether it be gravel, rock, boulders, the size of it. It includes the slope angles. It includes the species of the fish. There's a the whole, whole nine yards in there. But when we're talking specifically about shallow water, top water fishing in a lake like Lake Murray, um, you've got to realize that some lakes, you know, are different because Lake Murray's got a big blueback uh, herring population. So the bass react different to top waters on a blueback herring lake you know lake murray on the lower end of the lake you've got a lot of chasers out over super deep water but you also have a population of bass that live shallow on lake murray that don't really key in on those blueback herring and they stay shallow all year long so i'm going to pull up mine here johnny and i'll show you guys lake murray here um i can share my screen here present now yeah, just hit the present now, and then you should be able to click your screen, click the one with the Google Earth, and you should be good to go. Okay. Okay. You see that, Johnny? Yep, I got you. Okay, let's talk about the shallow opportunities you have on a typical man-made lake like Lake Murray. Now, even though this is a blueback carrying lake, you can apply this to uh, Threadfin Shad Lake, too, when you're talking about the shallow, shallow water options. When I'm thinking about topwater fishing um, in the summertime of the year on a lake like Lake Murray, there's basically three different scenarios that I want to key in on. And depending upon the type of cover, how many docks are in the lake. The first thing I, I want to do is I want to go to the lower end of the lake. And you can see here's the dam area at Lake Murray right here. And let's take this bay right here. Now, anytime a lot of people ask me, it's like, how do you find fish on a giant lake like that, like Lake Murray? The best thing to do on a deal like this is you is you isolate the area to a large creek or bay section like this. Because this right here, you can see there's four different little creek arms feeding in this bay. You know there's a big population of fish that live here all year long. So I would start concentrating here on the lower end. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is in the summertime on the lower end of the lake, Johnny's going to talk the, the uh, complete opposite, but I'm going to go in the very, very backs of these uh, small coves off these creek arms, the, the very, very back of them like this. And what I'm going to look for, let me get to the back of this one here, is there's always a population of individual rogue shallow bass that live in the back of these shallow cuts here. A lot of these bass, they're back here, they're bluegill hunters. And there, there doesn't necessarily have to be bluegill beds in the back of any of these cuts but these bass these lone roamers will be swimming and they set up territories in the very backs of these clear water cuts right here so one of the first things i'm going to do is i'm going to run start running the very backs of all these clear water cuts with some type of a walk and top water and the walk and top water that i like <clears throat> i don't like a big one i don't this is the, the situation where I don't use like a, a super spook. I love a, su a head and super spook, but it's too big in this situation. So in this situation, I'll use something like a mega bass dog X or giant dog X, which is about half the size of a super spook. And I start running the backs of these pockets right here, just covering water. I'll stop about probably, you know, 50 yards from the very back end of it, fan cast the whole back end, specifically targeting any type of overhanging trees and shade because in the summertime of the year, you want to target shade. Bass will relate to shade as some type of an ambush point in the back of these areas. So this is going to be my first 
option that I'm looking for on there. Now, the second option, and like I said, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more on Lake Norman, but um, another shallow water, clear water option you have in the summertime of the year is fishing seawalls and riprap around areas that have docks. Anytime you have a seawall or a riprap in a clear water situation, it's an ideal scenario to, to fish low light conditions early and late in the day with a popper. So if you've got seawalls around any of these docks over here, especially if they're located on a point like this, um, right off the bat in the morning, try like a little chugger pop bar on those seawalls and points. So that's my clear water options. Now my dirty water options on either a thread fin or a herring lake too is going to be the direct opposite. I'm going to be heading as far up this river as I can get. And I, what I want to get is I want to get where I can find the dirtiest water. So you can see right here up the Saluda River, you can see the water clarity change from the lake. Look at it here and it begins to get dirtier and dirtier. So I'm running as far as I can up in this area here where I still have these little creeks and coves off the main part of the lake. Take, for example, this one right here. Now, this is going to be your dirtiest water in the lake. And I'm going to sort of approach it the same way as I would down the lake, except it's a little bit different environment. You get back in the back of these upriver areas that have the dirty water. You don't really have the dock cover. You've probably got about 12 inches, 15 inches of visibility. So again, I'm going to run to the back of these flatter uh, little coves and creeks off the main river. And you can see here, like there's a lot of laydowns along this particular bank here. You're going to have laydowns along the bank. You're going to have, you know, shade thrown off on these trees here. And this is when I'm going to go to like either, you know, some type of a, a frog or some type of a, you know, a horny toad type bait some type of a subtle top water that I can get in real tight around any shade, maybe any shallow grass, any shallow wood targets in the back of these particular areas here. And uh, I'm, it's, I'm doing the same thing. It's like, it's like I'm concentrating on shallow cover. I'm concentrating on shade, running and gun in the back of these pockets. You're not going to have as many of them, but ideally what I'm looking for is like, you can see this bank right here that's throwing some shade off of it. Um, that's going to be an ideal scenario is if you can find shade shallow in the back of these things. And uh, so that's my that's my, you know, three basic scenarios for a man-made lake shallow right there. Good deal. Sorry, I was messing around off camera. I was trying to get some baits prepared and I pulled a spro frog out of a package, Randy, and it literally exploded on me. All the legs <laughs> came off. I don't know how it happened, but yeah, it, it kind of exploded on me. So um, yeah, apologize if I was making some noise in the background, uh, but really, uh, really good stuff there. And that's definitely something that I don't explore enough, Randy, is those mid-summer shallow topwater fish. I just have no confidence in them. And I'll kind of give you guys an idea of how I would be doing. If you could stop sharing your screen here, Randy. Yeah. Um, just a little bit. Basically, I do the exact opposite of what Randy does, which is basically he's going into the backs of the creeks looking for bass that are feeding either on um, bluegill perch, spawning perch, and then also back in some of these creeks on like a blueback herring lake, like a Lake Murray. There may be, be some shad, some threadfin shad and stuff back in way up the rivers and stuff like that. And you can kind of get on some normal type bass, I guess, that aren't on the, the, uh, the herring. But in my experience fishing on these type of lakes, which I don't have a ton of experience, I have probably, uh, you know, seven or eight times I've been over to those lakes, these type of lakes this time of year in the summertime. And whenever I go, I'm always fishing cane piles with blueback herring. And if you guys know about fishing in the summertime on a lake like Lake Murray, uh, Lake Lanier, um, Clark's Hill, those places like that. Fishing brush piles or cane piles in the summertime is the way to go offshore. Now, basically what a cane pile is, is it is a uh, brush pile that might be sitting on top of a point or a drop-off in not that deep of water. These cane piles and stuff might be in 15 to 25 feet of water at the max off of points, off of drop-offs. You're not going to find these cane piles out here in 40, 50, 60 feet of water. Or they may be out there, but they're not going to be as effective. Or if anything, the brush pile or cane pile might be in 25 feet of water, but it's 10 feet tall. So the top of that cane pile is in 15 feet of water. But the thing about these cane piles is that really what you're looking for on them is, um, 
you're trying to fish the tops of these piles. And if I pull up uh, really quick, I'll just pull up a recording of something that looks similar. Um, let me see here. Let me just pull up a recording here, something that looks, oh no, I don't have my the correct hard drive pulled up here. Well, never mind, that, that shoots that idea out of the water. Um, <laughs> apologize there. Um, I have actually, I have some new sonar recordings that I just got the other day. I'll pull these up. Um, I literally, literally just got them off table rock. They're not going to be perfect guys. They're going to be okay, but I'll give you a basic idea of what these cane piles are going to look like. So let me pull this up and let me share my screen. This is not going to be perfect, but this is, it'll, it'll be good enough. So basically here is a brush pile um, that's sitting in 15 feet of water that's seven feet tall and you can see there's some fish sitting up in here and there's some shad um, hanging out off the side. This is kind of what you're going to be looking for on these summertime lakes. Water visibility on a Lake Murray on the main lake might be eight to 15 feet of visibility and Basically, you're going to be able to sometimes even see the tops of these cane piles if you're just sitting your bow over the top of them. And these brush piles or cane piles, they're going to be tall because basically it's a bunch of bamboo that people stick in a bucket and it's going to be 10 feet tall easily. So you can see this brush pile here is not even that tall. It's only 8 feet tall, but it's very similar. And these fish are going to set up in and around these brush piles waiting for the bait fish that are over here to swim over the top of the brush and then they're going to ambush them. Now, the thing you'll find is that a lot of these bass will set up and sit in these cane piles throughout the day and not be active. What will happen is they're only going to get active when a school of blueback herring swim by the cane pile. The reason the blueback herring are swimming by the cane pile is that those trees that are in the bucket have nutrients, they have food that the, the herring can feed on. So those herring are going to move in, feed on the limbs of the um, bamboo or the cane that's in the uh, bucket that's on the middle of the lake and then those bass will sit there and ambush the herring as they're feeding. Now the big trick with this is that you really have to get lucky on the timing with these offshore uh, cane piles. You might find that at some point throughout the day there might be a school of fish sitting in this cane pile and at 11 o'clock in the afternoon, a school of blueback blue herring swing, swims in, gets on top of a cane pile on a point here, feeds for 15 to 30 minutes, and then they're gone. They have moved on. And then if you try to sit there and fish that cane pile for any longer than that, they're not going to bite. They're just going to be inactive. Those bass really are almost on like a feeding clock where when the herring are there, they're feeding. When they're not, they're not. And if you watch all the best anglers, especially when they used to fish the forest wood cup out here on this lake, what they'll do is they'll have a series of cane piles found around the entire lake. And in terms of locations for these cane piles, what I always find the most effective for me is I want to find cane piles that are in shallow water, let's say 15 to 25 feet of water, but close to a steep drop off. So here we have a very steep drop off from 25 feet of water down to 80 or 90 feet of water. Those sharp drop offs are key. And basically what I'll do is find as many many cane piles as I can that are close to a sharp drop off in 20, 15 to 25 feet of water, like a point like this, a point like this that drops off sharply. I mean, there's pr probably thousands of these cane piles where you have a sharp drop from 20 to 70 feet of water. And then what I'll do is I'll just rotate them and I'll have 15 to 40 cane piles found before I go fishing. If I have time, if not, then you just kind of have to go up to these spots and just hope you find a cane pile and, you know, kind of get lucky. And I've done that a couple of times and it's worked out okay. But the guys who are really good have 15 to 40 of these cane piles found in the summer. And they just pull up, they'll throw a top water over the top of these cane piles for five minutes, four minutes, like really, really quick time. If the fish are there, they catch a bunch of big fish right away. If they're not there, they pick up the troll motor and they run to the next spot. And you can watch these guys do this and actually a lot of their YouTube videos if you go back to some of the uh, tournaments that were on these herring style lakes. I think Jacob Wheeler did a video on um, Lake Chatoog uh, where he fished a blueback herring lake. I think he was throwing a big chug bug and then a uh, suspending jerk bait over the top of brush piles and cane piles on a herring lake. And you could see him pull up his trolling motor like 15 to 20 times uh, during that uh, video. It was kind of crazy. And he was just running, 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 running. Now, 
what I'm doing with this, these cane piles, guys, is I'm really focused on trying to call those fish up out of the top of that tree to the surface. Because all of these herring and stuff are swimming over the top of this brush, a lot of times that brush pile, again, is no more than 10 to 12 feet high. And those bass are just ravenous when those bait fish, those herring come in. So if you can throw a top water over the top that's causing a lot of commotion, a lot of wake or movement, they're going to mistake your bait for a fleeing herring and they're going to bite. What this means is you need a bait, guys, that has that generates a lot of commotion. So what I find is uh, basically the two baits that have always worked really well for me are a pencil popper. This is a Yozuri 3DB pencil uh, pencil popper 135. I've thrown different ones over the years. This is just the one I grabbed out of my tackle box. And I like it. Um, I've just thrown this recently just because it has that uh, nice translucent finish. It's kind of reflective. And it also chugs at the front. So it has a chugging mouth and it walks really, really well side to side. It also sits really deep in the water, this one in particular, which then causes even more commotion. So I like this one quite a bit. And it's a big bait. It moves a lot of water, throws a lot of water. I put a feather on the back. And this is the type of bait that will draw those fish from 10, 15 feet deep up to eat on the surface. And the reason that this type of bait works great on the surface is because those bass don't get a good look at it. And you can work it fast, work it really quickly across the surface. And those bass will, again, mistake it for a fleeing herring. And just works really, really well. Another bait that I throw a lot in those situations, and I'll do this even on gizzard shad lakes and, you know, threadfin shad lakes also if they're really clear, is I'll throw a uh, fluke. This is a Strike King Caffeine Shad 5-inch. I'll put it on a 6 aught extra wide gap heavy wire hook and that will get that bait to sink a little bit quicker and I'll fire that thing out there and then reel it really fast and kill it reel it really fast and kill it and I'm just killing it for a few seconds one way guys do it over there uh, a lot in the east coast is they'll pull the fluke they'll pull it with the rod 15 feet sometimes even like really pull it far then reel up all the slack and then pull it and they're just reeling and pulling reel pull reel pull and they're doing that and they're working that fluke really fast across the surface and it's triggering triggering a lot of those bites now this is something that works really well on those herring lakes i have not seen it work as well on other lakes across the country it i mean i've caught fish doing it but it's not like the best way to catch him on a lot of other lakes. So herring is very specific. We started with the, probably a very specific case, but it's something that's really interesting to check out. So that is the first case here, Andy. So um, any comments on that before we move on to the next lake? You know, I, I've have had I've had quite a bit of experience fishing herring lakes offshore around those cane piles back east. There, one of the things that I've noticed about that is when you have a mixed species lake, a mixed species blueback carrying lake, like Lake Murray, uh, Lake Lanier, Clarks Hill, uh, you know, some of those type of lakes, Hartwell. I mean, you, those fish are so keyed in on those herring that I bet 75% of the bass that I get to bite a topwater bait around cane piles offshore, they blow the thing out of the water and won't get it, or they'll boil all around it. I've never seen anything like it. It's like, those fish are so focused in on specifically those herring that it is hard to catch them. I find I find that the offshore topwater fish on a herring lake are much more difficult to catch than a threadfin lake. For sure, definitely. Um, it's they they they're really tricky. That's why you have to go to some unique baits. I know Ryan uh, over here in the chat. He says talk about the chug bug. He wants me to give away the secrets about the chug bug. Uh, the chug bug he's talking about guys is a big. It's like a four inch chug bug. Um, I can buy them in the striper section at Walmart and I've caught some really good fish on a big chug bug. It just moves a lot of water, pushes a lot of water. And with those herring, the more commotion you can make, it gets them excited. It gets them to, to target your bait and eat it better. So you want as much commotion and move it as fast and as aggressive as possible. Yeah. So that is the deal there. Uh, next up, Randy, let's talk about uh, maybe a more standard situation. So we just talked about the the blueback herring lakes let's transition to another lake that is clear but without the blueback herring so a clear lake 8 to 15 feet of water visibility maybe 20 foot of water visibilities at times but no herring maybe there's just gizzard shad and threadfin shad and the lake we're going to talk about there is lake cherokee over in uh kentucky tennessee area so uh randy how would you target a lake that's clear without the blueback herring 
You know, the a clear water, non blueback herring lake that has mixed species to me is my favorite summertime topwater lake. I mean, any lake that you have that's got that, those scenarios, you're going to have some good topwater fishing, not just early and late in the day. And a lot of people associate topwater fishing as just something you throw right off the bat in the morning and then you put it down or if it's raining or something like that. But guys, I'm telling you right now, if you have a mixed species lake and you have a lake that has a tendency to have more spotted bass and smallmouth bass like Lake Cherokee than it does largemouth, they'll bite that all day long in the heat of the summer with no wind. And I'm going to pull up the Lake Cherokee, and I'm going to sort of show you guys what I'm talking about here. So, um, okay, you got it there, Johnny. Yep, I got it. <clears throat> first thing that you know you want to, or the first thing that you, you sort of have to get in your mind if you're talking about all day topwater fishing on any lake is you've got to commit to the technique and you've got to commit to the pattern. It's like anything else. It's like, you know, what Johnny does with offshore fishing or it's like what I do for flipping. You can't just go out there and give it like an hour or two and put it down. <clears throat> Something that you've got to say, okay, I'm going to do this all day long from the time that I get up in the morning until the time that uh, we put the boat on the trailer, we're not going to do anything else. So the biggest advice I'll give you guys if you want to experience some of the stuff like we're talking about is don't take anything else, but your top waters with you. And the two top waters that I'm throwing in a clear water environment like this with the thread fin shad population is a walking top water and a wake bait. And uh, the two that I use is, is um, I love that the, the, the super spook is a great one. Mega best diamante giant dog X. Uh, some people like that. Strike King Sexy Dog. I haven't used that much, but a lot of people like that. And the red fin. You know, the red fin is like a, it's an old time secret favorite bait here in the Ozarks where I grew up. And it's a great bait to throw in the summertime. Yeah, there it is right there. It's a great bait to throw in the summertime of the year. So here's a couple different scenarios what I'm looking at, uh, Lake Cherokee here. This is how I would go about it. First thing I'm going to do is, you have to decide what type of point angle that the bass are on because my first target in this situation is main lake and secondary points. And you have to identify the rock composition, the angle, and then you can sometimes pattern it. For example, uh, the times that I've done good at Cherokee here, and I, I love Lake Cherokee. Lake Cherokee is one of my top five favorite lakes in the country. I just absolutely love this place. Um, it's it's a small lake but it's full of fish and I, I really like the way it lays out here so here on lake cherokee you've got basically set up you've got this side of the lake the east side of the lake that tends to be steeper these are like steep rocky bluffy type banks here and then on the west side of the lake this entire section here is a little bit flatter these are identical these the west or the uh yeah the west side of the lake here is sort of characterized by gravel type points flatter type gravel points uh, that run way out into the lake. And here's what I'm looking for. Here's the uh, definition of a main lake point here and a secondary point back here. These are going to be your, your sweet spots for summertime topwater fishing, specifically if you have a lot of smallmouth and spotted bass on there. So what I'll do is I'm running a pattern as, a, as I'm bouncing back and forth between these secondary points and the main points. Early in the morning, what I do on both of these type points is I'm going to I'm going to have that bait right against the shoreline in less than three foot of water. And if I've got shade thrown off on the bank or any type of low light condition, I'm going to simply run down the lake and I'm going to hit as many of these points as I possibly can right against the bank. I'm talking about in, you know, in two, three foot of water and I'm going to bounce. I'm going to bounce around between like a secondary point like this main point hit as many as i can now once that sun gets up and it's say it's 10 o'clock 11 o'clock in the morning i'm going to stay on these same flatter points they can be island points again they can be rounded gravelly points secondary but what i'm going to do is i'm going to move farther out and i'm going to get my boat in that 20 to 30 foot zone and i'm going to fan cast all around that 20 to 30 foot zone 
the key for this working guys is you've got to have water visibility of at least six feet if you don't have six foot of visibility this doesn't work but what happens if you have a lake like this that has a big small mouth and spotted bass population these same bass that are living on these points that Johnny's catching, dragging his fish the moment offshore jig in 20 foot of water, those same bass are going to come out of that 20 foot of water and hammer that top water. They'll, they'll actually, you'll pull the bass off the bottom out of 20 foot of water to hit it on the point ends and the point sides. And this is something that a lot of people don't know. And it's sort of a byproduct from fishing up north a lot. I mean, I spent a lot of time fishing up north in the summer. This is a technique that I refined up there. I developed on Bull Shoals Lake, Table Rock Lake, some of the lakes around here. And most people, you know, they give up after the first couple hours when we're on these when they're when they're against the bank here, and they don't realize they can move out over this open water and catch those same fish all day long. The scenario that I like the best for that has nothing to do with the sky conditions. I don't care if it's raining. I don't care if it's sunny or partly cloudy. What I do want is light wind. I want, you know, calm conditions or just a barely just a little chop on the water. Because if you have anything over like a five to seven mile an hour wind, you simply can't pull those big fish out of that deep water because they, they can't, they don't, they're not, it, the, the bait is not obvious enough for to pull them out of that deep water. So that's why you need the, uh, uh, the calm situations. So that's one scenario. The second scenario, the scenario that I'm doing in a clear water lake is I'll hopscotch back on the other side of the lake. Now, this particular section right here of Cherokee Lake, this is a this is a typical bluff bank right here on Cherokee. And the thing about these bluff banks like this, see this, see this shade line right here, guys. Anytime that you have a, a lake that has a lot of bluffs on it, any type of highland reservoir. Doesn't matter if it's Douglas Lake, it can be, you, you know, Lake Cumberland, it can be an Ozark Lake, whatever. You're always going to have a big shade line on these bluffs, even up in the day. Like this could be noon right here. And another pattern I like to have in the summertime of the year is I get out on these main lake bluffs like this that have these shade lines like this. I get the boat right against the bank and I just bomb out long casts with the walking top water um, along these shade lines and just cover the water. This only works good, again, if you have a lake that has 75% of the bass in it are either a mix of spotted bass or uh, smallmouth bass. I mean, you can catch largemouth in it, but it's much better with that. So I'm looking for, I'm just basically running these little shade pockets. It doesn't have to be a lot of shade. It can be, it can be a section of shade that's only 15 or 20 foot long, and that's enough to hold the bass. I mean, I've, I've had lots of days on the summertime on lakes like this where I just ran the lake looking for shade pockets and a lot of people may pull up on a long section like this and they want they want a long section but for me you know i can just get a little like just right here just a little bitty shade pocket or maybe a couple big trees up on the bank that are that's thrown off some shade and there'll be a big one laying in that shade a lot of times and the third pattern i do that you can't overlook again is the bluegill pattern when you're talking about shallow water summertime top water fishing Guys, you cannot overlook the bluegill pattern. And the bluegill pattern, I like to move up the lake a little bit until I start getting a little bit off colored water. And notice here, you've got some good clear water down here, but once you start getting up in this part of the lake, you start getting a little bit of color in the water. And that's what I'm looking for. The bluegill, to me, they, 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 bed, they bed more and they bed better in these areas like this that have just a little bit of color to them. And the things that you want to look for in these bedding bluegill areas, um, I don't like like the super long coves. I like the shorter cuts, you, something like this or something like this right here. And I'll zoom in on it. And uh, these shorter cuts like this are the ones that I find that the bluegill bed will bed better in. Now this right here, you can see the lake level is really low here, but a lot of times if it's a little bit higher than this, you're going to have maybe some isolated wood back in some of these pockets, um, maybe some larger rock. There could be some overhanging trees. And these bluegills, again, just like on Lake Murray, they'll bed in the back of these pockets. And it's the same deal. I'm taking the walking top water, running the last 50 feet in the, in the, in the back in here, running around, hitting this one right here, cranking up the motor, running around, hitting this one. And I just move all the way up the lake running these short, no-name pockets like this. 
and don't spend your time when you're when you're after the bluegill hunters these rogue bass that are chasing bluegill don't run in there and say well i don't see any bluegill beds so there's no bass here you have to hit everything because like i said the the bluegill hunters are a population of their bass on their own they're usually larger they're bigger and they move and they just swim around and cruise in the back of these things so that's the three main ways that i approach a uh, clear water lake in the summertime <clears throat> Randy, you just gave away all the juice right there. I hope you guys were taking notes because that is a lot of good info um, right there. I don't think that uh, – I think it's probably one of the most information-packed 15 minutes of the uh, Fish the Moment live uh, history right there. So definitely take notes on that. Randy is an expert shallow water summertime fisherman, so that's some really good stuff there. The only thing I would really add to what Randy was talking about is – on that first pattern where he was talking about fishing some of these gradual sloping points on the main lake that stick out, uh, he's, he mentioned just kind of getting on these points and just kind of fan casting them. And obviously that's a uh, really, you know, simple way to target some of these offshore points. And I like to get a little bit more specific when I'm trying to do my offshore topwater fishing in the summertime. And one great question we actually got from Timo was, why a topwater versus any other bait, a swim bait, a football jig, a spoon, whatever? The reason that we throw topwaters, Timo, in the summertime is because topwaters in general are going to trigger some of the biggest bites that you're going to get. You're not going to get the numbers. You're not going to catch 30, 40 fish a day on a topwater usually during the summertime. It's usually going to be one of those deals where you're going to get 5 to maybe 15 bites a day if you're really lucky, but they're going to be big ones. So if you're focused on trying to get better than average quality bites and also just have some fun catching fish that blow up on the surface, topwater is a really good way to go in the summer. But it's definitely not usually the most effective way to catch numbers in the summer so if you're struggling to even catch a fish don't go to the top water that's not a good idea but if you're getting comfortable catching a lot of numbers in the summer and want to up your quality that's when you should go to the top water now getting back to what i was talking about here on that point strategy that randy was talking about instead of just going on these points kind of randomly fan casting then moving on to the next one i actually like to use my electronics which is a big shocker probably to you guys mm -hmm. um and what i like to do is graph for two specific things so the first thing I'm going to graph for is I like to find brush piles off the tip of points on these clear water lakes, usually when the water visibility is at least 8 feet or more visibility. 8 to 15 feet of visibility is kind of the water clarity I'm looking for, or even clearer. Now I'm looking for brush piles that have fish in them that top out in 10 to 15 feet of water. If you can find a brush pile that tops out in 10 to 15 feet of water, like this one does here, and you have 10 to 15 feet of water visibility, you can work a top water over the top of that brush, and those fish will come up and eat it, whether it's the middle of the day, the first hour of the morning, it's an all-day deal. And what you'll find is that the fish that come up out of that brush pile to eat that top water are going to be the biggest and most aggressive fish. And it's a great way to start fishing these brush piles in the summer. I start by throwing that big top water over the top of those fish. If they come up and eat it, I catch a really good one. Then I can go back in with a 10 inch worm, a drop shot, a shaky head, a bunch of different baits to try to milk that brush pile a little bit more. Another deal that works really well, especially on lakes with standing timber, are looking for bass that are suspended in the tops of trees. You can see there's a bunch of fish right here suspended in the tops of some standing timber. The timber tops out in 20 feet of water, and those bass are set up a little bit higher in that 15-foot range. If those bass are suspended, you know, 8 to 15 feet from the surface, and sometimes I find them even shallower than this, basically you'll find that those bass will set up there and they'll come up and eat a topwater over those trees. And I've caught some really good fish on Table Rock over the years doing that. And a lot of these trees might be in 40 or 50 or even 60 feet of water. So if we go back over to, if we go back over here to Cherokee, you'll see that you might find some of these fish that are setting up in the middle of these kind of guts or off the tip of these points a little bit deeper, and those trees might be sitting right here in 60, 70 feet of water. They might be 30 or 40 or 50 feet tall even, and the ones that are right on the edge of these points, like right here, the tops of the trees are in 8 to 15 feet, the base of the trees in 35 to 55 feet, 
And those are the trees that those fish will move into once the sun starts coming up. You can catch them on that top water. You can also catch those fish on a drop shot as well, things like that. But it's fun to catch them on the top water. And again, it gets you some really, 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 really big bites and just some fun bites. So that's all I would add on the uh, clear water, uh, top water stuff. Man, we have so much more to cover, though. we still got three more lake types here, Randy. So we need to uh, keep it rolling. And really quick, before we jump into the next topic, I uh, want to do some of our shameless plugs, as always. Um, got to pay the bills here at the Fish the Moment Live. So first thing I want to talk about, guys, is an upcoming seminar that we're doing on fishthemoment.com. I know some of you guys are probably disappointed. Oh, man, Johnny, you're only talking about southern impoundments with, you know, shad and gizzard shad, blueback herring, all that stuff. Well, don't worry. We have you covered this upcoming week. Next week, we're going to be doing a virtual seminar specifically on natural lakes up north, so northern natural lakes. Randy and I both have a lot of experience fishing up north. I was born in Wisconsin and grew up there. That's where I learned to fish. And I have a lot of experience fishing for largemouth in shallow and offshore grass up north. Randy has a ton of experience from fishing on the FLW and Bassmaster Elite Series uh, or Bassmaster Top 150 Tours. Fishing for smallmouth on the Great Lakes and a lot of those northern lakes. So Randy's going to be covering how to target smallmouth on natural lakes and i'm going to be covering how to target largemouth on natural lakes in this seminar if you guys want more instruction on natural lakes and feel like you don't get it on other channels definitely check out the seminar it'll definitely be well worth it and another thing is that we're going to explain how to translate the information that we talk about down south to your northern lakes so you can better utilize the information we provide if you like our content and that way you can get the most out of our videos last but not least there's only 30 spots available, and I want to try to uh, fill up the seminar. We're only, uh, let's see how many spots are left here. We have 14 spots, still have some time. If we don't fill up the seminar, though, I'm probably not going to do another one of these northern seminars because not that many people are from up north, uh, but if you guys do fill up the seminar, it lets me know you're interested in talking about northern natural lakes, and we can do more content about it. But if the seminar doesn't fill up, then we're probably just going to have to... Uh, Focus more on the other type of lakes where we get a little bit more, uh, where we have more of our audience. So if you guys are interested, check out the seminar and uh, you know, let us know by signing up that you want some of that content. One other thing to talk about, Randy, is how guys can sign up or, or get entered into our Bridgeford Beef Jerky Giveaway this week. So every week, guys, we give away a case of Bridgeford Beef Jerky. Shout out to Bridgeford for sponsoring the podcast. Uh, you get 12 packages of beef jerky in this case. Really good deal, and we gave away the uh, the winner. It was Christopher. Check out. Uh, make sure to send us. It was Christopher French. Uh, make sure to send us an email at infoofficialmoment.com with your shipping address. We'll get the case of beef jerky shipped to you. And for this week's giveaway, all I got, all I want you guys to do is go down in the comments of this live stream. I want you to go to the actual comments, not in the chat here. So go comment on the video. You'll have to like minimize the screen if you're watching it live. Go leave an actual comment down below. And if you do that, let us know what your favorite topwater lure is in the summertime and what your favorite brand is. So your favorite topwater and its brands, like a Spro Bronze Eye Popping Frog, a Cotton Cordell Redfin, whatever it is, leave that down in the comments below. Again, not in the chat here. Put it in the actual comments. I'll go through the comments and pick a random winner next week, and we'll give you a free case of Bridgeford Beef Jerky. Again, huge shout out to Bridgeford, supporting bass fishing, supporting the podcast, and just making really good snacks for on the lake. Awesome. Well, Randy, we got so much more to talk about. We have to just fly through this because we have so many other lakes to cover. What we're going to do is we're going to kind of split this up a little bit so that Randy's going to talk about one type of lake and I'm going to talk about the other two types of lakes and we're just going to kind of fly through this as quick as we can. So Randy, I want you to start here by talking about an average man-made impoundment. How do you catch fish on top water on your average man-made impoundment? This is two to four foot of water visibility, um, you know, not super clear, but it's not dirty. It's not like you have six inches of water visibility, two to four foot of visibility, very, very normal situation. And for this, we're going to be talking about Lake Norman over in um, North Carolina. It's, you know, average water visibility, two to five feet, depending on where you are. Pretty typical lake for around the country. How would you handle fishing in top water in that situation, Randy? All righty, let's pull up Lake Norman here. I'll share my screen. Okay, 
got it there, Johnny. Yep, and real quick, uh, J-Rob, um, you, do you have a brush pile rotation strategy? Um, check out my video on my main YouTube. This is the Fish the Moment Live channel. Go to the main Fish the Moment channel and just type in Fish the Moment Brush Piles. I have a complete guide to brush pile fishing. I explain which brush piles I'm looking for, how to identify them on the fish finder, and how I rotate them. I actually give like a strategy guide for it, so it's exactly what you're looking for. Just type in Fish the Moment Brush Pile and you'll find my complete guide to brush pile fishing. It's like a 20 minute video, really good deal. Check that out. Okay, go okay. for it, Randy. Yeah, this, uh, when you're talking about water visibilities of two to four feet, that sort of covers a lot of the lakes across the country because there's very few lakes in the country that don't have some water visibility in that classification. You know, it doesn't matter what part of the country you're in, you have that in there. So the first thing that I like for is when I'm fishing a lake that is under these uh, situations um i love to fish seawalls and riprap around docks and let's let me see if i can pull some up here this is like i said lake norman again um okay i like this now when to me this is just like a main lake point at norman when you're on a lake that has this type of a visibility you don't have the bass say this is two foot of visibility right here which is pretty typical for norman you're not going to have these bass that will rise out of this deeper water off these point ends like you would on a lake like Lake Cherokee. These bass are going to be more bank oriented. And since they're bank oriented, the sky conditions and the time of day become much more critical because the activity and the thing that positions them shallower are the, the basically, you know, your uh, light levels because these fish here, like on the, on these riprap points, let me, uh, zoom in a little bit more lake norman has got a ton of this type this man-made riprap point and most docks most lakes that have docks they have some type of a seawall like behind the walkways on both sides of them and riprap in between them that's very common in a lot of man-made lakes and this right here is the number one situation where i love to hit early and late in the day or on rainy days and i get in there fish right against the bank, you know, key on these main points and around the docks with a, like a chug bug, a pop bar, some type of a small pop top water that you can keep into one place, maybe even a small prop bait, something like that. You'll find for the most part is when you've got that water visibility sort of in that two foot range, it sometimes is a little bit dirty for a walking top water it's a little bit clean for something like a frog or something like that, or maybe a whopper plopper, but they really like the chugger type. So the, the, the number one thing that I look for in the typical man-made lake is, uh, you know, any type of main secondary point, uh, you know, it's got riprap or any type of uh, uh, seawall behind it with the chugger. Now, the second thing that I do on this situation is I go down the lake to find the cleanest water in the lake. And uh, let me scroll out here a little bit. This and the, the again, the, the popper deal, guys, when you're talking about a pop bar or a chug bug, it always works better for me in the mid part of the lake where, where you have you don't have the dirty water like you have up the river, but you sort of have a mix of the clean, dirty water. That's when that chugger works better. But in another situation, like I said, same lake, I'll go to the lower end of the lake and this can be the same. It doesn't matter. If I'm on Grand Lake in Oklahoma or Lake Eufaula in Alabama, it's the same deal. You're going to have your cleanest water here on the lower end of the lake. And on a lake like uh, Murray, I mean, yeah, excuse me, a lake like Norman is one of the things I'm looking for again is I'm looking for these long, flat points that actually they're not really points. They're more like shoals. And a lot of these eastern lakes like this, they have these long shoals that will run out in the lake. I guess this is one right here. I don't have my Navionics pulled up, but these points right here have different variations of shoals that run out into them. And if you get into that situation where you have that closer to that four foot of visibility, this is when you can get out on those flat shoals. And I'm talking about, again, even though it may be a long way off the bank, like right here, it still may only be three to five foot deep, way out off the bank. I could be a hundred yards out off the bank and it's still going to be shallow. This is when I'll take that walking top water again, like the Mega Bass Diamante, Giant Dog X, uh, Zara Spook, something like that. And I'll fish around the shallow shoals out here in that four to 
uh, four to eight foot zone, something like that. I don't feel like I can pull up a bass in this visibility over, you know, much more than that. So uh, that's what, sort of what I'm looking for in that scenario. And another thing you'll find out if you have a man-made lake, a typical man-made lake that's got closer to four foot of visibility, there's always going to be some type of schooling activity off the end of these main points that are real sporadic. And it doesn't make any difference the time of day. It can be nine o'clock in the morning. It could be two o'clock in the afternoon. It could be whenever. So you always want to have a topwater ready to go for those schoolers. And finally, um, again, don't overlook the bluegill areas. I mean, anytime you've got two to four foot of uh, visibility, uh, run the back of all this stuff with the blue, you know, for the bluegill bite. And uh, that's the, usually the way I approach that. Good deal. Good stuff. That is the kind of average water visibility. So let's kind of talk about some of the dirtier water lakes. Let's say you have less than a foot and a half visibility, less than two foot of visibility, really stained up water. And I actually spent a lot of time fishing in the summer on shallow, muddy lakes. I grew up fishing the Arkansas River uh, when I was in high school a lot and Lake Dardanelle. So I have a lot of experience actually fishing in the middle of the summer up in real dirty water. You guys don't know me as a, uh, a shallow water fisherman, but Randy, I used to be a river rat on the Arkansas River. I used to actually be better fishing shallow, muddy water than anything else. I don't do it that much anymore because we don't have that much stuff up here in the Ozarks. I haven't done it in like five or six years. I'm a little bit rusty, but I still have a lot of experience out there. So well, let me kind of show you guys what I'm talking about with some of these um, dirtier water lakes. So if we take a look at um, this area, or this is Lake Dardanelle here, and we just kind of take a look at, um, you know, what we're dealing with. You can see the main river, we have really dirty water. And when I'm talking dirty, I mean, you know, pretty much anywhere between a foot, foot and a half water visibility, something in there. And let me, uh, let me actually go back over here. I'd, I had a good date found and I just ruined it. I'm looking at Lake Ufala here too. We're going to take a look at a couple of different lakes. But um, in terms of Dardanelle, the main river you're going to have is a lot of stains of the water. And if we are going to fish in this type of uh, water visibility, there's two things you need to either find. One is shallow vegetation, and the other is some sort of clear water off the main lake where you have all this mud and all of this dirtiness. So if we take a look here with all that dirty water... If you're going to fish in that real stained water, you need to find some sort of vegetation. And on Lake Dardanelle, that's usually going to be in the form of lily pads or shallow water willow grass. So here is a point of lily pads right off the main river. I actually know this stretch right here. I fish it very often. You can see that there is a uh, stretch. Uh, this is the main river. So the main river channel runs right up against these shallow lily pads. These lily pads maybe are no more than three to four feet of water. But right out in front of them out here in this area right here, you have the creek channel. So that's where your creek channel is, right where the yellow pin is. So these fish can move from this deeper water up to the shallow lily pads feed and then move back out the gizzard chow will move up in here as well and this bite works the entire summer even when the water temperatures are 89 90 degrees and it's the middle of the day one o'clock in the afternoon and a lot of times even the best time to fish these lily pad stretches on the main river or places like this is during the middle of the day like right up in the middle of the day fish will get up under those lily pads and you can catch them on a frog really really well spro bronze eye popping frog or like a regular spro uh, bronze eye frog works really great fishing through those lily pads you can also flip those pads with a jig and stuff like that as well another place you can find them in those lily pads are places further back in the backwaters where you have deeper water like a ditch like you can see right here running into a shallower group of pads so even you don't need like necessarily a creek channel but if you can find a depression that's six or seven feet deep right out in front of some shallower lily pads with three feet on both sides this stretch right here is where you're going to get your bites and most of your fish are going to come within maybe 20 to 30 yards of the edge of those pads. Usually in the mornings, they're going to be more towards the outside edge. As the day progresses, they'll move deeper into the pads, and they're usually feeding on bluegill. Now, at times, they will feed on gizzard shad, especially more on the main river, but if you're off the main river, it's more the bluegill. You can actually hear the bluegill popping in those pads, and I'll make a full video 
about this uh, at some point. Uh, but basically, um, this is um, you know this is something I used to do a lot. So here, listen for the bluegill popping in the pads off the main river. We're looking for the big gizzard shad in the pads on on the actual main river. You can also catch some of these fish if you go to certain banks, especially on the outside river bends, where you actually can find flooded water willow grass. And I'm going to try to find a good image of this because right here is a really good stretch of shallow water willow. I don't know if I can find a good satellite image. Apparently I can't. Um, <laughs> let me see here. There's a bunch of water willow down this bank. Let me find a... I'll go to the Illinois Bayou and show you what it looks like. But basically, if you go to the main river se sections right here, right on the main river where there's a lot of current, or back in these backwaters where there's quite a bit of current, and find shallow water willow grass. This is basically what it looks like, guys. You kind of know what I'm talking about if you have ever fished water willow. Water willow grass like this, um, or like this, it sticks pretty close to the bank. And you can catch fish on a frog in the first couple hours of the morning really well in this grass or when there's a ton of current flowing. If you have heavy current running by that grass, you can throw a frog in that grass all day long and crush him even in the middle of the summer. So those are two patterns that work really well. But if you don't have a lot of water willow or a lot of lily pads in your lake and it's a shallow, muddy lake still, another way you can catch them is actually by abandoning the main lake sections like you can see here or even like those uh, kind of backwater stretches where the lily pads would be and instead I like to head up the lake and get into some of these backwaters and what I'll do is I'll get all the way in the back of some creeks and pockets where you can find the water clearing up a little bit let me find a good image of this for you guys here we go so if you look here's an image of the main river right here very dirty, very muddy. If you can sneak over some of these little jetties sometimes though, sneak in through here, maybe get up on plane and kind of rip around and get way back into some of these backwaters that have clear water in them. If you take a look right here, you can see that there's dirty water, one foot of visibility, but in some of these little backwater sneaky holes, you can find two, three, four, five foot of water visibility at times. And back in here, you can crush them on a little popper, a little frog, up around shallow stumps and laydowns and things like that. And really a top water is one of the few ways you can get them to bite. And I will throw a little, um, I'll show you a little sneaky deal that I do. Um, let me stop sharing my screen. Oh, what happened to Randy here? Randy. There we go. Sorry, I lost you there, Randy. I didn't even look malfunction there. I didn't, uh, I didn't even notice I was just rolling. <laughs> Uh, but anyways, uh, what I was talking about here is uh, my little my little sneaky baits is a prop bait, and this isn't the exact one I always throw. Sometimes I'll throw them that are more sartreuse. This is just the one I had in my box. This is a Kelly J um, prop bait, but you can also throw the Brian B's prop bait. Those are really really good, and uh, they're wooden. They're super expensive, but throwing that is works really really well, guys. Um, up in that shallow muddy water. And that is, or sorry, not the shallow muddy water, but in the clear water on those muddy water lakes. So if you go into these backwaters and you find clear water on this muddy, you know, dirty lake, that's where you're going to get a lot of good bites. Throw in a little prop bait, a little popper back in these pockets, again, around stumps, lay down, stuff like that. To give you another example, let's switch over to Lake Eufaula in Alabama. And if we come over here, you can see similar situation where you can go up the river. And if we pull up a little bit later date here, give me a second to find a good date where you can see the water clarity. There we go. If you run up into the river arms and up to the top end of you follow, here's kind of the dam, stuff like this. If you run way up the lake and get into where it muddies up again, one foot of water visibility. You can still catch fish on you fall up in the shallow lily pads. There's lily pads in this lake. There's shallow water willow in this lake. So this lake has, you know, very similar setup to Dardanelle in ways. But if you don't have that, you can also sneak into some of these backwaters, like for example right here, where you go in from the dirty water and get back into some clearer water back in here. Even if you could sneak back in this little pond, that would be even better. And bass will set up in this stuff all summer because of that clear water. 
That clear water usually indicates that it's cleaner water, a little bit healthier water, maybe because of vegetation, maybe just because it filters out from natural um, uh, rain that comes in there or like a feeder creek. Whatever it is, if you can find that clear water when the majority of the water is really stained, usually there's a higher quality to that water, even way back in the back of these cuts, and it will give those fish a place where they can live all summer long. So I'm always looking for places where I can sneak in. Looks like you can't sneak in here, but any place you can look on these river sections where you can see clear water. And if you can hop in to like a backwater, for example, back in here and find some clear water relative to the main river arm, that's key for your top water on those dirty water lakes. So that's the deal right there um, on those type of lakes. One other type of lake that uh, we want to talk about, Randy, and I'll kind of let you cover this, is those grass lakes, like the TVA lakes, a lake, uh, Gunnersville, Southern Grass Impoundments. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'll kind of let you cover that, Randy, really quick. Do you have any comments on those dirty water lakes? I know you kind of missed some of my what I was talking about, but any other comments there? Yeah, to me, it's like when I'm when I think about the dirty water shallow lakes like that, I'm thinking about the frogs and the horny toads. And I tell you one bait, guys, that y'all, if you haven't tried this, is Zoom makes a frog called a Zoom frog, and it's like a horny toad. It's not it's not a walking frog like a spro frog. It's like a horny toad that makes a lot of noise. And you can kill it, and you can stop it, and it floats like a frog, but then you can jerk it, and it blurble, or, uh, you know, makes a bunch of gurgling noise. I've done really good in any type of shallow water stained vegetation like you're talking about on that. Okay, so let's go to uh, let's go to Gunnersville a little bit. The Southern Grass Lake's a good good example here. Um, one of the things that I found out about um, TVA lakes is it, they're real finicky when it comes to topwater fishing. I mean, you can catch fish on. If there's a decent fall time topwater bite on TVA lakes, like on shell shell bars and bars and and that type of stuff. But other than that, you're dealing a lot of times with um, hydrilla or milfoil or a mix of that type of stuff. And one of the things that I like to do uh, on any TVA lake is I'm looking for the matted vegetation. And of course, you can't really see it here because I'm not sure. Hey, Randy, can you uh, share your screen here? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh... I'm sorry. Hey, can you see me now? Can yep, you see gotcha. it here? Yep. Okay. One of the things that you can't really, you can't really see it here. This is the upper end of, uh, or the, the, uh, the Roseberry Creek area on the main lake of Gunnersville here. Here you got the main channel on it. You can't really see it here. I'm not sure when this is the time frame on this one is. If you go a little bit further down um, the lake, I think you should be able to see some of that grass. Yeah, I'm looking here. It looks, it looks really dirty there. See here. Well, I, I can give you an example up here, even though I can't really see it on this. Here would be like the main river, like here. Here, here would be like the channel edges right here. Another channel edge right here. On all these TVA lakes, Chickamauga, Gunnersville, Kentucky Lake, back when it had uh, a grass on it. Lake Pickwick now, like Pickwick's got a lot of grass on it. These vast flats off the main river here, like this, you know, have a lot of shallow millful on the lip here now the channel may drop off into 20 some feet but the immediate lip off the channel is sometimes in three to four foot of water under normal clarities and that in the summertime it'll it'll mat up all along the shallow flat here off the main river on both sides sides of it and this is when you have you know just your typical frog fishing deal it's not really the same type of frog fishing like johnny was talking about at dardanelle this is frog fishing over vast flats of grass out here. You know, these bass will use anywhere between the edge to back, you know, 100 feet back into there. It's a matter of just fan casting out here in the open areas with the grass there. And uh, you can't, for some reason, it's on a grass lake, uh, southern grass lakes. They don't bite very good on the edge of the grass. They're usually up in the matted type of stuff. So that, therefore, that really limits your techniques that you can possibly use. And one of the things that uh, I like to use in this situation, too, that doesn't get used much anymore is the old Johnson uh, spoon, the Johnson silver or silver minnow. Uh, 
I have hammered them on a silver min. It's, they're silver minnows, aren't they? That's not the name of them, Johnny. Silver. Yeah, Johnson silver minnow. The uh, yeah. we used to fish those for uh, northern pike up in Wisconsin yeah. growing up. <laughs> and my buddy Danny Cree had got me tuned in on that, and we finished. Um, I got third place at the Bassmaster Top 150 at Lake Hudson fishing this type of stuff on it in the summertime on the Johnson silver minnow. And I'd usually take a gold one, like a three quarter ounce gold one with a chartreuse spinnerbait skirt on it and wallow it through that same shallow millfoil that most people are throwing frogs. And it's a forgotten bait that still catches giants. So when you got, you guys may consider buying a couple Johnson silver minnows and trying it there. But anyway, Southern grass lake guys, when you're talking about any type of TVA lake, uh, where you got the big flats, concentrate, you know, on the frog type baits, way over over these flats, and that's that's what's going to be the main deal with that. Good deal. I'm pulling up that Johnson Sil. I think it's the Johnson Silver Spoon. Yeah. Um, I'll I'll pull that up to show you guys. Or yeah, Johnson Silver Minnow Spoon. That yeah. is, man, I have some of those actually lying around uh, somewhere in my office. They might be out. I don't know. I was I wanted right. to do a video with those. I have like six or seven of them that I uh, well. For years, the Bassmaster record for the limit for seven fish limit, Ron Shearer held that for years on a Johnson Silver Minnow at Lake Okeechobee. I mean, it it withstood twenty some years of a record, and uh, I usually put a trailer hook on it, like a small number two aught trailer hook and a spinnerbait skirt. And Danny and I have whacked them on that thing. Yeah, just putting a little grub on the back. I used to put a twin tail. Uh, Kalen's twib and tail grub on the back of that thing. There was actually one they used to make locally where they would have, uh, it would actually be made of rubber and they called it the scum frog. I don't know if you guys mm -hmm. ever heard of that up north, but it was like a, it was a rubber version of the Johnson Silver Spoon. So um, that, I still have some of those lying around too. And that was actually the first topwater fish I ever caught in my life was on this scum frog, scum toad thing. I'll have to mm -hmm. dig it out somewhere. It's green. It's it's, it's literally a silver, Johnson silver spoon, but it's made of plastic. That thing was awesome. I used to throw that all the time. So yeah, that's a uh, that's something. Uh, I know up north people throw it quite a bit, but it's not something we see down mm -hmm. here quite often. We're gonna have to do a Johnson silver spoon challenge, Randy, yeah. one of these days. There's a, another big key on that is you need to tie that with a loop knot because that loop knot gives it twice the action as if you tie it straight direct to it. So, um, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's a fun way to catch them, man. They boil up on it. Good. Oh yeah. It's, it's a good deal. Awesome. Well, Randy, that is pretty much, uh, all she wrote for all of these different patterns or all these different lakes. And, uh, one thing I wanted to remind everyone about really quick, if you guys are interested is head over to fishmoment.com, and if you like the content here in this seminar uh, or this live stream, you'll love the information in our virtual seminars. We just kind of go off the cuff, off the cuff in these live streams, but these seminars we spend, you know, pretty much an entire day, me and Randy both, uh, putting together all the slides, the content, all that stuff. So we're draining, you know, fifteen to twenty hours into just making slides, presentations, stuff like that, um, trying to make the best possible information for you that's easy to understand obviously in these live streams we're just kind of talking you know as we go but we get really prepared for these seminars to make sure we deliver as much value as possible and we try to give you guys really um, helpful graphics and charts things like that that you can take to the lake you can use while you're on the water things like that so definitely check out some of these seminars that we're doing we have obviously have recordings of our past seminars if you're interested in any of those we also have our upcoming seminar on natural lakes up north so if you guys want more content about how to fish up north on these natural lakes for both largemouth and smallmouth this is the seminar for you it's gonna be focused heavily on bass behavior because we don't talk about that that much on uh, on the channel or really at all on the Fish Moment channel or on the live stream. So we're going to really dig into bass behavior on natural lakes, both largemouth and smallmouth. It's a great seminar. We only have 30 spots available for it, so definitely sign up, and it's uh, July 22nd. So that is that, Randy. Also check out some of our upcoming lake breakdowns, both offshore and shallow, if you guys are looking for some help finding some spots on your home lake. So other than that, Randy, excited to uh, continue knocking out more content. Got a really cool challenge video that we did on Table Rock Lake that's going to be coming up this Friday for you guys. Just 
posted a new series, actually, guys, that uh, I'm calling the Catch 15 series. So if you guys go to my YouTube channel, Fish the Moment, this is the Fish the Moment live channel. It's a separate channel. Go to the main Fish the Moment channel. Head there and check out my latest video. I did a Catch 15 challenge where I try to catch five bass for 15 pounds with no practice and eight hours of fishing. So it's on public bodies of water, no practice. I feel like it's going to be hard to to meet that goal, Randy. I feel like I'm setting myself up for failure with this, but I guess that's kind of the point here. Because I want to show how hard it is to go with no practice to a public body of water and catch 15 pounds. Because you guys see all these pro fishermen hammering them on the Elite Series. Watch guys in tournaments catching these giant bags of fish, catching you know three and four and five pounders all the time. And you guys don't realize that these guys are spending a week pre-practicing for these tournaments. So they'll come in March for a June tournament and they'll spend a week out there learning the lake. Then they'll go three days before the tournament and fish for three full days, 15-hour days or 12-hour days. Then they actually go fish the tournament. So obviously, it's a lot easier to go find and catch fish when you've practiced for all that time. With no practice, with no idea where the fish are on lakes I'm really not that familiar with, much harder to catch a limit for 15 pounds. So I'm, I'm setting myself up for a difficult uh, gauntlet here, Randy, but I think, uh, think I'm up for the task. Oh, 15 pounds is not easy to catch anywhere. I mean, you can you can look at some of the tournaments they have at St. Lawrence River or Lake, Lake St. Clair, and there's not everybody that even catches 15 pounds up there. So I'd be pretty impressed, man. If you can catch 15 pounds every show, that that's like uh, you know shooting subpar in golf all the time or something. For sure. Well, I know some guys up north see Aaron here is like 15 pounds, 15 pounds on the St. Lawrence River or Lake Champlain is nothing. 80th place at the recent Bassmaster Elite Series event on Champlain was 15 pounds. 15 pounds up north on smallmouth lakes is very different than 15 pounds down yeah. south on the lakes I'm fishing down here. 15 pounds will put you in the top five, top 10 in any tournament almost year round on any of these lakes that I'm fishing. Yeah. Those northern smallmouth lakes, that's like cheating. Those fish get fished for <laughs> five months out of the year. The rest of the time, it's frozen over. They don't get any pressure, and they just are growing like crazy. So I know you guys up north are like, 15 pounds, that's nothing. That's so easy. <laughs> it is not easy down here. And you guys who fish down south, you know, catching 15 pounds a day is not easy yeah. at all in these southern lakes. Yeah, it's impossible at times. Not only it's not easy, it's impossible. Yeah, it's, it can be tough. So, I mean, I know that there's this Beaver Lake Elite Series where it's always one with 15 pounds, but there's 120 boats in it, and one or two guys catches 15 pounds in that tournament, and then 120, or 118 of the 120 other guys don't catch that. So, it's tough. Uh, and I know, like, the, the weekend, actually, Randy, where I did that Catch 15 Challenge, there was a tournament on Grand Lake. The heaviest weight that won a tournament that whole weekend was 14 pounds, like 14.8 pounds or something like that yeah if you guys watch my catch 15 video I actually complete the challenge and had 15 pounds so i would have won that tournament just fishing solo so that was pretty cool there uh but uh you know gonna keep that challenge alive gonna try to keep it going i'm gonna fail a lot i have a feeling it's not gonna always go well uh but i feel like it's a worthy challenge at least yeah good deal um so if you guys go uh, you know, again, go to the main Fish the Moment channel. Make sure you subscribe there. I've heard a lot of guys are getting unsubscribed from the YouTube channel, my main Fish the Moment channel. So if you're still here listening and you guys like the content, make sure you're actually subscribed to the main Fish the Moment channel because a lot of people just get unsubscribed from YouTube by YouTube for some reason. Also, subscribe to this main, the uh, Fish the Moment live channel, the one you're on right now. If you guys want to get notified of upcoming live streams like this and uh, like the video if you're still here, it really helps us out. Just If 164 people leave a like, this video will do 10 times better than it would if none of you left a like. So um, that's also really helpful to us. Again, huge shout out to Bridgeford for sponsoring the podcast. If you guys do want to get a chance to win a free case of Bridgeford beef jerky, 12 packs of Bridgeford beef jerky, leave a comment down below in the actual comment section, not in the chat here, but in the actual pro um, uh, comment section, letting me know what your favorite topwater bait and brand is in the summertime. So like a Spro Bronze Eye Proppin' Frog or a Cotton Cordell uh, uh, Redfin, whatever it is, 
Let me know what your favorite top water bait is in the brand in the comment of, comments of this live stream, and you have a chance to win a free case of Bridgeford beef jerky. And again, Christopher French, send us over an email at infofishmoment.com for your um, case of beef jerky for winning this week. So again, thanks guys for always tuning in for the live stream. I know there's a lot of stuff going on, so we always appreciate you guys tuning in, and I hope you guys are enjoying the stream. Randy, thanks for joining me as usual. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Hope to see you guys on the 22nd for that seminar because even if you don't fish up north, there's going to be a lot of solid information that you guys can take back. You know, any part of the country, there'll be a lot of stuff for largemouth, smallmouth, both. So hope to see you guys on the 22nd. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. Have a great night.